But tonight, we're going to learn about Theodore Case. Uh, Antonia Colella will be talking about, now we're talking, the story of Theodore W. w Case and Sound on Film. And she's going to be answering two questions. So we're going to have a quiz at the end. <laughs> How can we be certain that Theodore Case actually uh, is the father of talking movies? And why is it that Theodore Case isn't on our list of famous inventors? Anybody ever heard of Theodore Case? Yeah, Charlie, Charlie's heard of him. But, I mean, you know, he's right up there with Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell, and yet no one has ever heard of them, or hardly any one except Charlie and me. And okay. But let me tell you, the only biography she would give me is she earned degrees in education from Rosary Hill College, George Washington University, and Syracuse University. She wrote articles about education for newspapers and professional journals before retiring from her 42-year career in education. Tony Colella. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. It was a, can you, yes. is this okay? Yeah. <laughs> it was a pleasure planning this with you. So we'll, I'm going to have the presentation and then afterwards leave uh, time for discussion, objections, criticisms, <laughs> questions, <laughs> comments. And um, if you, the name of the book is Now We're Talking, the special sale tonight, only $10. So it was a red bag because Mr. Case always wore a red carnation. So thank you for this opportunity to honor Theodore Willard Case, the father of talking movies. Mr. Case was a scientist. He was born in Auburn, New York on December 12, 1888. He worked in Auburn, raised his family in Auburn, and died from pneumonia in an Auburn hospital at the young age of 55. There are, have you been, you've been to Auburn, so I hopefully you know some of these um, uh, structures that are related to the Case family. Some of them will be used in the presentation. Uh, first is the Willard Chapel, which is named after Ted's great, great, great uncle, Dr. Sylvester Willard. And Dr. Willard, with his father-in-law, Erastus Case, made a ton of money with the Oswego Starch Factory and his pioneers in the railroad building of our country. Um, Dr. Willard had two daughters who built the chapel, and they had a good friend by the name of Louis Tiffany. So Willard Chapel is the only complete and unaltered, totally Tiffany-designed religious interior known to exist in the world. So if you get to Auburn, it's worthwhile to go see the Willard Chapel. Next is the Seymour Library on Genesee Street. It was built to honor Ted's grandparents. Um, the true name of the library building is the Case Memorial. And the designers of the library went on to build the New York City Public Library. Third is the English Tudor Mansion on South Street. It had over 35 rooms, four floors, eight chimneys, an indoor swimming pool with below surface lighting, and a full floor gymnasium. But Jane, who we'll talk a little bit about tonight, Jane is Ted Case's daughter. She's 95 years old. She lives in Scarborough, Maine, and we've been best buds for 13 years. Jane said the house was much too large for only four children. <laughs> Fourth is Kazawasco, which is on the west side of Owasco Lake near Moravia. It was built by Ted's father for the family's summer home, and it had over a mile of lakefront shoreline. Kazawasco means case on Owasco. Kazawasco. And fifth is the Cugan Museum of History and Art on Genesee Street, also in Auburn. 
and especially the backyard greenhouse where Ted Case created. He just didn't gather uh, tools that other people had uh, discovered or made and reassembled them. He actually created the tools that made him a World War I hero and earned for him the right to be called the father of talking movies. In fact, in 2004, my son and co-author Luke, this is Luke at 10, now he's 24, um, proposed before Auburn City Council that the city of Auburn be officially designated the birthplace of talking movies. And we were told it was one of the few times at that time where the council voted unanimously. <laughs> so as Bud said, I'm here to address two questions. How can we be certain that Ted Case is the father of talking movies? And this being so, why isn't his name on the list of famous inventors of the 20th century? Let's begin in Ted's early years. He grew up in a scientific environment. His father was an internationally known scientist who even spoke before the Royal Society of London and who taught his son the procedures and the persevering attitude of the scientific method. Moving ahead to 1911, Ted is now a junior at Yale University and he writes a letter home to his mother. The letter begins, Dearest Mother, first sentence, well, the prom went off finally, and we all had a wonderful time. Second sentence. Most of my time is taken up in experimenting with my selenium cell, with the idea in mind of photographing sound waves. Something you can't see, but that was his passion, photographing something you can't see sound waves. One month later, he writes home again. Dearest mother, first sentence, yesterday I at last succeeded in transmitting sound by light. The year is 1911. 1912, Ted graduates from Yale. He spends six months at Harvard Law School but decides to return home to Auburn to work with his father. And he starts making a name for himself. At this time, Thomas Edison and a host of others are trying to extract electrical energy from coal. But Ted tries a new perspective. He bypasses coal and generates electricity directly from sunlight and then creates a battery that produces electricity simply by allowing sun to shine on the cell. Sound familiar? <laughs> and in 1916, New York Electrical Society luncheon in New York City, the moderator said this about Ted. Mr. Case is a young engineer, not yet particularly well known to the world or to fame, but I think we shall hear from him later. There is every evidence that he is blazing out a new trail and is doing part of the experimental work of which the, electric, the electrical industries stand more in need than ever. Also in 1916, Ted and his father inherit Dr. Willard's house, which is now the Cayuga Museum on Genesee Street. Ted is still trying to photograph sound waves, but he's realizing selenium is not sensitive enough for what he wants to do. Voila! In Dr. Willard's collection of crystals and minerals, Ted finds a compound of thallium, oxygen, and sulfur that is highly responsive to invisible light rays, to infrared rays rays and he produces he uses this compound to produce a brand new type of photoelectric cell 
1917, the United States enters World War I and immediately addresses the problem of how to stop U-boats from sinking our ships, carrying soldiers and supplies to Europe. The government calls on Ted Case to help with this problem. Ted uses his new infrared photoelectric cell to create a communication system that can send undetected signals and even the voice past the enemy, thus saving the lives of hundreds of Allied soldiers at sea. After the war, Ted receives a letter from the then acting Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Yale University sends out a questionnaire asking, how did the war affect the alumni? Ted writes back about the methods he developed with the Navy to make light signals audible. He said he wasn't at liberty to discuss the details of this technology and that the government has halted all further development of voice transmission apparatus. Well, the government may have start, stopped working on this new technology, but hard at work in his Auburn laboratory, Ted continues to work on the naval recording system that is based on his photoelectric cell. 1920, Dr. Lee DeForest, another Yale graduate, contacts Ted. It seems there's been an international race over the last 40 years in England, France, Germany, India, Japan, a race to put sound on motion picture film. Dr. DeForest is now in this race, but he hasn't a clue how to win it, so he contacts Ted and asks if he can help solve the problem of synchronizing sound on film. Ted is only too happy to oblige. He thought his work would be useful for weather bureaus in agriculture, electrical lighting companies. He had never thought of its benefit to the motion picture industry. But lo and behold, Ted Case had in hand what DeForest and the rest of the world had been seeking all these years. Within a month, he polished his prototype and sent it off to DeForest, who lived in New York City. DeForest is ecstatic, and he writes Ted a Western Union telegram which reads, New cell gives no scratches whatever, is great improvement over all the others, and by all means keep making this type. We will return to Dr. DeForest. In 1923, the Auburn newspaper runs the headline, Talking Pictures Invented by Auburn Man. The article said of the invention, quote, words will come exactly in time with the movement of the actor's lips and in their natural voice. <laughs> the night before, the reporter and other Albertians had been invited by Ted to his uh, studio, which is uh, the second floor of his carriage house. Ted had even made a film of himself in which he described his technology and explains how talking movies are made. The reporter admitted he needed to quote Ted because the operation, the process, was much too complicated to paraphrase. So too in our book, we quote the reporter's quote of Ted's words <laughs> describing the technology. 1924, Case films the first talking movie of an American president. The president is Calvin Coolidge, who, go, who went by the nickname Silent Cam. So everyone was so surprised when President Coolidge spoke on and on and on in front of the camera. 1926, an important meeting takes place. 
Ted Case meets William Fox. You know, 20th Century Fox, Fox News, Fox Sports. And he shows Mr. Fox his talking movie, movies. I think it was of a, a canary in a cage at that time. Mr. Kate, Mr. Fox is highly skeptical. He thinks that the sound is really coming from behind a curtain in his office. <laughs> so he insists that Ted reshow his movies in Mr. Fox's private home in Woodmere. Well, after that private showing, Fox knew that of all the sound systems on the market, Ted's optical sound system was the most advanced. So the two men sign a contract. They form, put it this up. they form the Fox Case Corporation, and they call all of their movies, talking movies, movie tone. Nineteen twenty-seven. Permit me to interject at this time that Case's daughter Jane re um, compares her father to Steve Jobs. She says, "Someone who always wants to make a fabulous invention even better." And so it was. In nineteen twenty-seven, Ted writes an article for the Yale Scientific Magazine. It's in the red binder up here afterwards if you'd like to look through it. Um, Case says, it has been the intention in building up the movie tone system to make it as simple as possible so that portable sets may be placed in an automobile so that sound pictures may be taken almost anywhere. The article ends with the sentence, quote, it is evident that the new system is not limited to the studio. The first Fox Case Movie Tone newsreel recorded outside of the studio was of the West Point Band in their 125th anniversary parade. The film showed in the Roxy Theater in New York City, and a reporter wrote, the film was overwhelming in both image and sound, virtually perfect. And this was only the beginning. Fox Case Movie Tone takes off and films news and events all around the world. In Rome, Italy, it films a tour of the Colosseum and the uh, Vatican Choir concert. In England, the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace and a lecture by George Bernard Shaw. Back in the States, Movie Tone captures Charles Lindbergh's solo departure to Paris in the spirit of St. Louis. And one of Ted's favorite events, the Yale Army <laughs> football game. <laughs> Fox Case Movie Tone News had no competition. People young and old were rushing to the theater to see these movie tone shorts that played before the full length silent movie. By 1928, there were 900 theaters at home and abroad equipped with a movie tone sound system. <clears throat> Excuse me. William Fox handled the business end of movie tone, while Ted continued to work in his Auburn laboratory to make his talking technology even better. He discovered a way to eliminate background noise, which made possible the first full-length outdoors talking movie, which of course, gentlemen, was a Western. 
course, it wasn't a CD, but <laughs> it was called In Old Arizona, and it starred Warner Baxter as the Cisco Kid. Well, the audience went wild to hear the whistle of a passing train and crows or roosters crowing in the distance, the sound of bacon sizzling on the open fire, and the clip clop of horses as the riders rode off into the sunset. So by 1930, every home and abroad, every motion picture company was using the sound on film technology that was created, developed, and perfected by Theodore Case of Auburn, New York. Which begs the question, why isn't his name as famous as Thomas Edison? In fact, in 1923, Edison writes Ted a letter he wanted to get information on this new photoelectric cell. Well, Case writes back something like, I'm very sorry. I can't oblige you. I'm under contract with a Northrop company. You'll have to go through them to get information on my work. So why isn't Ted Case well known? Two men are among the reasons why, and we've mentioned their names already. The first, Dr. Lee DeForest. If you recall, Dr. DeForest was the one who introduced Ted to the motion picture industry. And for this, we give him credit. But Dr. DeForest had a reputation for publicly proclaiming other people's work as his own. In 1923 interview with the New York Times, he said that the original idea for the sound and film technology was his. And in 1925, he claimed full credit for the Coolidge film, which played in New York City in front of 500 journalists and publishers from around the world. Well, after many warnings to stop these misrepresentations, Ted Case ended their business relationship. A little aside, Luke and I agree that one of the, the thrills of doing research is you never know what you're going to find. And we came across one of this little, uh, little known fact that connects Ted Case with one of the biggest characters on the silver screen. Here's the story. Ted Case, being the gentleman that he was, simply <coughs> parted ways with DeForest. But other inventors who were duped by DeForest took him to court. So in 1927, DeForest needs a lot of money. He's near bankruptcy because of all these legal battles he has to fight. So he sells some of Ted's equipment that he had kept. And he sells it to a movie investor by the name of Patrick Powers. And when Patrick Powers takes the equipment, movie tone, and renames it to Cinephone. And he sells it to an animation entrepreneur who wants to give a voice to his mouse. So the star of Walt Disney's first talking animation, Mickey Mouse, got his voice directly from Theodore Case of Auburn, New York. Luke and I wonder if the Disney dynasty knows who to thank for their fame and fortune. We'd like to tell them <laughs> it's Theodore Case. The second person who robbed Case of his legacy was none other than his business partner, William Fox. To his credit, William Fox was a visionary. A lot of people at the time were thinking, uh-uh, not talking movies, it's immoral, it ruins the intelligence, no way. But William Fox knew talking movies would prevail. 
but he hedged his bets. The contract between Fox and Case said that if, if any part of the contract, which is just between them, changed, that Fox would tell Case about it. But he didn't. He allowed other companies to use Ted's equipment. So in the overnight frenzy that ended silent movies and ushered in the talkies, Ted Case's equipment was traded, loaned, copied, sold, stolen, and as we saw with Patrick Powers, renamed. Further insight into the inspirational life of Theater Case can be found in our book, Now We're Talking. The introduction was done by Case's grandson, Theodore Willard Case III. And the entire book was read and edited by Jane, who I told you now lives in Scarborough, Maine, at 95. Um, there, in, our, in our draft, which he read, there was a paragraph which listed all the names of the first stars of talking movies. And we included the name of, um, let me know, oh, I lost his name, Jason Robards. Jane writes back, her letter is in the red binder, remove Jason Robards' name. He married Lauren Bacall after Bogey died. <laughs> so we took out his name. <laughs> My son and I paid a visit to Jane last summer. She's still a fountain of information about her father. She said he omitted using the word I, but would rather say, it came to mind that, or it has been the intention to. Jane told us her father had a great sense of humor and was devoted to his wife and children who he taught golf and tennis and sailing and swimming on both Owasco Lake and Skinny Atlas Lake. She also said he never spoke an improper word. And once when she was wrapping a present and having a difficult time and an improper word slipped from her lips, her father reprimanded her by saying, Jane, Save some words for the men to say. <laughs> Another of Jane's stories became the epilogue of our book. She said, One day I came home all upset. I had just read an article in the Saturday Evening Post that gave credit for my father's sound film creations to someone else. I showed father the article. He read it and turned to me in his usual gentle manner and said, it's all right, Janie. It doesn't matter what others say or think. I know what I did. I would like to end by saying that <clears throat> Mr. Case's message, above all, in my opinion, is to embrace the ideas that the good Lord gives us. I'm sure he would endorse this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. I believe this quote summarizes the mission of the Glen Haven Historical Society and well describes the life and the legacy of the father of talking movies, Theodore Willard Case. <laughs> Thank you. So comments, criticisms, objections, questions, <laughs> stories of your own that you would know? Yes. Were there no, no patents then? There were patents. There were patents. They didn't do it. You didn't apply to them. There were 62 patents that are listed right here in the book that were recognized at home and abroad. Sometimes people go abroad, bring home a patent, and claim it as their own. 
his were recognized. He, um, he was wealthy enough to have lawyers. So every time something did materialize that was to his satisfaction, he had a patent made from it. So there were. What happened is William Fox knew he had a good thing, so he just overexpanded himself. And he had a, around, a, he owed $15 million at the time of a car accident. So his, the people who he owed the money to said, we'll forgive your debt if you hand over the patents. So that's why I always begin the talk by saying, Ted Case was a scientist. He was not a businessman. And um, so a lot of people say, did, so was he poor? So I asked Jane, I said, did, did the family lose everything? And she says, no, my father put enough money in trust for the children and his wife that we were well taken care of. And uh, she said the depression was going on and, uh, and, and they didn't really know it. But there's a book out now called Cold Girls. During World War II, there were people who would break the codes or make the codes with the Japanese, and she was a code girl. <laughs> so, not hoity-toity, our Jane. She was an athlete and a code breaker and a wonderful person. Did he have any more um, uh, interaction with Edison? Other than the letter that was sent, did, he, oh. did they communicate? Or? I think during the time of World War I, they went to Connecticut at an experimental station when they were testing out this um, uh, ship-to-shore type of secret communication system, and Edison was there. I know that for a fact. Um, whether they socialized or not, I'm not sure. I know Walt Disney and um, Jack Warner came to Auburn to Kazawasco, so some people did, but uh, I'm not sure. You can almost imagine that they would along the, bump into each other along the way. Talk a little bit about the end. <laughs> Meaning, was he at all involved in technology of the buildup before World War II? He died in 44. So, um, in the technology of that, I don't think so. I don't think so. He, what he started to do after, after he was very hurt that William Fox broke their contract. He, in the museum, he said he had all of, he was a prolific writer, a prolific um, historian. Anytime uh, newspaper articles were in the paper, he'd take them and fold them. So on one page of a scrapbook, he may have five or six or seven or eight different papers. Up when he found out that William Fox had broken the contract, he stopped all of that. He just ended that part of his life. But he did go to work with a French doctor, and they started experimenting with sound waves on the muscles and glands in the body and the effect of color. And he worked for the Pan American Union. I don't know how he got there, but uh, so he went in a, in a different direction. Jane said he was always experimenting for, because that's what he did. He was a natural experimenter. But um, there's nothing that I've read that connects him with the, the preparations for World War II. Do you know? Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. What did the four children do? Jane's brothers and sisters? Um, one was in the military. Um, two girls, two guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. But I do know that in our Fort Hill Cemetery, where Harriet Tubman is buried, William Seward, um, Chief Long, there is a, a plot probably from here to the end wall for the Case family. And everyone, from Erastus Case, whose daughter married Sylvester Willard way back when, everyone is buried there. So um, I'll, I'll look into that. You didn't know what, but I'll look into it. I asked Jane, I'll, 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 she'll be happy to hear 
that someone asked about her brothers and sisters. Now I'll get back to you on that. Okay. The, the laboratory is open to the public. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How did they preserve his, uh, I was going to say utensils, like his uh, experimental uh, stuff? Uh, that's an, you know, I said two men were among the reasons why. Case left the Kugi Museum, the greenhouse, for a museum for movie tone. Mm -hmm. The Smithsonian wanted all of his technology and notebooks, etc. And he says, no, I want to leave them in Auburn. He could have lived anywhere in the world. He'd love to live in Auburn. And um, so the, the, the professor who took it over put all the sacred nitrate, nitrate films, mm -hmm. the first films, stuffed them in the closet. And all of this technology stuffed it in the closet. So it wasn't properly managed until some of the members of the Case family came around in the 1990s and said, this is not supposed to be a museum for Native Americans, right. which it was, or for ballet lessons. Mm -hmm. And so now we have the greenhouse. I, I would like to have the whole building as, as, um, as we talked earlier. It was my suggestion for a $10 million project. Everyone loves movies. You go to Cooperstown and everything's baseball. But the second most important thing is the Glimmer Glass Opera. Same thing with Auburn. We can have this new, we have a new multi-million dollar information center being built. The Equal Rights Heritage Center. Which some people will love and other people will not like that. So we need diversity, just like baseball and opera, history and movies. <laughs> and uh, so we work on that. So please spread the word. Auburn, New York is the birthplace of talking movies. I hope I convinced you. <laughs> what, did, what did they do with the, the Case Willard house, or the Willard Case house, after they built the big Case mansion? But it belongs to the Huga Museum. It is the oh, Huga so, Museum. So when he when he built the big house, right? Then he gave it to the. He yes, and so. it says some people say five cigars and a dollar, and some people say one cigar and five dollars, but for a minimum amount. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, you know, nothing's. Perfect, and I think his wife, once she got a taste of New York City, even though she's from Auburn, wanted to go back to New York City. So mm -hmm. thus, to appease her, this <coughs> huge, it's still the biggest house in Auburn, was, was made for her. But the museum has the, the Case Willard House. Yes? What street did you say that house was on? The, the mansion is on South Street, mm -hmm. and the Willard uh, House is the Cuga Museum. It's next to the Schweinfurth Museum on Genesee Street. Yeah. yeah. You know, Case has his message to follow your own ideas. Do you ever have an idea and then <laughs> somebody, years later, somebody took that idea. He told Jane, when I have an idea, 200,000 people around the world have the same idea, but they brush it off. Mm -hmm. But I know that six people, six or seven people around the world are taking that idea to heart and working on it. So when I talk with students, that's what I try to tell them. And even, you know, we we're, we're still get our ideas too, don't we? <laughs> Out gardening or something, I, I call it meditation and movement. That's when the idea is flowing in out. <laughs> I gotta quickly write them down though before I forget them. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, and if anyone has other questions, I'd be glad to chat with you. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful audience. She said to thank you. Thank you. We have a story of the Glen Haven School oh. and a cat's meow of the school. So thank you for Isn't coming. that special? Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to dedicate one of the books okay. to your library. Thank you. Thank you.